What is going on, guys? And welcome back to another episode of Elevate. And today I am beyond excited as it is going to be close to Valentine's Day when this drops to have psychologist Dr. Joshua Smith on the podcast. Josh, can you please introduce yourself for those that might not be familiar with you? Of course. Uh, Thank you so much for having me on. I'm psyched that we were able to put this together and I'm looking forward to it. Um, So I'm not sure how much of an introduction you want me to give. The 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 brief overview is you know as you said I work as a psychologist uh, three days a week uh, I'm in a pain setting so I work as a pain psychologist with lots of different chronic illnesses um, anywhere from kind of post operative to nerve based or really any chronic condition um, and then I do a little bit of individual work where it's individual couples family uh, I've had some trauma experience um, you know and so that I cover. A, a lot of different, a lot of different topics, but that's the, that that's the, the very quick nuts and bolts. I love it. So on your social media recently, I've noticed that you've posted a lot more about toxic behavior, personality disorders, and that's what I really want to get into the weeds with today. So first let's define toxic behavior. What does that oh, look wonderful. like? Um, let's get, let's get clear on the discussion around that today. Oh, that it's a great starting point because I had even, I was thinking about that in advance because a lot of the things that I put up, I, I use toxic or toxic behavior as, as a descriptor more than anything, because whether we're talking about a narcissism, whether we're talking about borderline personality disorder, there are a lot of different personality disorders that might not necessarily meet the criteria for an official diagnosis, but you see these personality clusters or how people present. A lot of it just comes down to the toxicity of it and how it drains your resources, how one person can dominate a huge portion of your day-to-day thinking or thought. I think the whole notion of toxicity, I like that as a term because it encompasses almost all of it. And sometimes we default to using narcissism as the go-to because we're we're all a little bit more familiar with it. Mm-hmm. Um, but it all doesn't fit quite into that category. So In general, I think it goes anywhere from the extreme side is when you get into sociopathy or psychopathy and, you know, people who, who want, who overtly want to do harm. Um, And then all of these other personality disorders have a lot of overlap and they're not all toxic, right? So you can have somebody who is narcissistic, but doesn't necessarily have to be toxic or, uh, or a, a really difficult or hard person in your life. It's when you get into that notion of how they treat other people, what their expectations are. And I often talk about narcissism and borderline personality disorder are my two go-tos. And the big difference there is a narcissist is much more focused on, they're, they're more egocentric. It's more a notion of they see the world through how it impacts them. It's a little bit more of an, honestly, it can sometimes be more of an anger or resentment-based presentation. They're so frustrated that the world doesn't see them for what they believe their value is. So there is more of an aggravation or anger that they're not being treated the way that they think. A borderline personality disorder often has so similar components, more of a fear of abandonment, more of this fear of being rejected. So they often reject in advance. There's this entitlement of your time or a real need for on their side for you to always put them top of your list. And when you don't, they can actually be really, really nasty or horrible because what they're doing is essentially saying, well, whoa, 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 if I'm not top of your list, I need to make sure I almost reject or knock you down a peg before I even you even get the chance to reject me. So the toxic part is, I think about that in, if you have someone in your life that you've dated in your family, in your friend group, that somehow you're all their state of being is always in your mind. If you make a choice, if you buy something, some part of you is like, I need to let them know, or they might be angry, or they might have a reaction. And that's kind of, that's kind of what I really think of as, as that toxicity is that feeling of like, what do they take up? How much time and how much space do they take up from you? If you have a group of friends and the people you often let down are the ones that understand the ones that you can say, oh, hey, I'm busy, or this came up, I'm so sorry, that you know will be like, yeah, no problem, I get it. Uh, so it's almost and often as, you, 
Yeah, it's almost as if they sever your own identity of independence, right? So it's it's something that eliminates your autonomy almost because you're so fearful maybe, and I don't know if fearful is the right word, but um, considerate of how they may respond to an action or decision that you make. So without their approval, right, it can cause that anxiety of what if this isn't okay or is it okay or how are they going to respond what are they going to say what am I going to come home to what is the reaction going to be um and I think that that part of it is important and so I read this I don't know if you're familiar with Dr. Romani Mm -hmm. um she yeah so she researches narcissism specifically and so I got a couple of her books and I was like let me do some research before we dive into this podcast right And so from her perspective, um, she says that a narcissistic personality is someone who is actually very insecure. And so they present themselves. And I know that there's multiple different types of narcissism and we can discuss the different ones, but one of them being kind of the grandiose, right? And that's the one that we think of the one that's got all the nice cars and the nice clothes and they're quite condescending and very egocentric and everything is about them. And it's just fantastic and wonderful but they're almost like a box of chocolates because you don't really know what you're going to get on a personal relationship. And I think that one thing that I've noted, because I tend to gravitate towards these types of personalities, which is something that I am very introspective about, is that they can present themselves in such a captivating and charismatic way that it's quite enticing for you to gravitate towards them naturally. And so um, one, I'm curious on if you agree with that, that it's really coming from a place of, of insecurity um, to kind of overcompensate with what they believe that they should be viewed as um, and constantly kind of chasing that admiration and status. I, I totally agree with that. Um, it, it's kind of the veneer of a narcissist. They can actually be incredibly charming and really charismatic A narcissist can be somebody who can control a room, but it's all for show. It's all a presentation. It's not in line with how they often feel internally, which is why they need so much external validation. For somebody in that narcissist borderline category, it almost doesn't count unless you have an audience. Mm -hmm. That's why you'll find these are the kind of people that will let you know about everything in their life. If they they get a new car, they'll send a picture to a group of friends. Nobody else in that friend group has ever sent a picture of a car or anything they bought, but they will. And it's because it doesn't count unless people are jealous of it. Unless people want it and are jealous of it, there's no value for them. They are not operating on, this is something I genuinely love and care about. And therefore, whether I get, if I get a car that I love and it makes me happy, that's all that matters. It's not all that matters. It's the showy part. It's the, do other people want it? Do other people covet it? Are other people jealous? That gives it value. So they want an audience all the time. They want people to know everything that they're doing every day of the week, because otherwise it doesn't, it doesn't count for them. They want people to kind of want their life. And it's why they also really struggle to ever be very supportive of somebody else. If somebody else does something that gets them admiration, if gets them accolades, gets them a response, if that same friend group texts and says, oh my God, that's amazing, they're furious. Their response is an anger one because they're like, I don't get it. How come I don't get that love and adoration? I just sent the, the I just sent this thing I did at work. I sent people a copy of this. I said, how come I didn't get that unbelievable praise? So they'll be pissed. They'll be furious at that friend but they like it to be hidden. They don't want to come right out and be like, well, that makes me feel bad because I also had a work thing and nobody gave me credit. No, that would be way too threatening because it gets to that insecurity. So they're more likely to respond in the group thread and say, that's amazing. And then send a separate thread just to that person and be like, hey, listen, I am absolutely and totally happy for you. This is awesome. Just want to give you some feedback. Or just just so you know, yesterday so and so wrote this, and nobody really wrote back, and now you're they, they want to take you down a peg. They want to let you know you didn't do that right, because they can't handle that they're not the one getting all of this this love. Um, which is, but it's often for a high functioning borderline or narcissist, you don't see it. Only so that almost, individual sees it. 
So it's almost like if someone else's success would take from their own, their spotlight can't be shined onto somebody else, or it, it activates some type of discomfort internally, maybe even anger or resentment. And then it's setting out to hold on. I need to bring this person down a peg because they cannot outshine the master kind of, mm -hmm. kind of attitude. I, I was talking to somebody about this recently who was sharing that a friend of theirs at work, and it's a friend who is like really loved and everybody everybody likes this person. And there's one narcissist in the office that has like targeted her. And this is what we were talking about. Where it was like, right, that narcissist believes they're right. They believe they see the world in black and white. They, they think they see correctly and nobody else does. So all day they're walking around irritated that they do life right and nobody else does. So if somebody else gets all of this love and adoration, they're furious because that's what they think they should be getting all the time. So it's and like they, in comparison to them, everyone else is somehow incompetent, right. right? That's how they see it. They see it as, and the funny thing is, if you find a high functioning narcissist or borderline, um, very often they see how everybody else should be doing things differently. The further you are outside of their internal circle, the less they care. The closer you are to them, the more frustrating it is when you don't do it right. So they feel the need to tell you everything. They also see it as their responsibility. So if you are a friend of theirs and you don't do something right in their eyes and they're mad at you, even if it has nothing to do with you, some part of them is like, well, if this is really a close relationship, I shouldn't hold on to the fact that I'm mad that you did something that doesn't affect me, I have to call you and tell you because that's what makes us close. And they believe that they want the same in return. They believe that you should also be telling them anytime you disagree with them. That's why they get so mad if they ever find out that you've said something negative about them to another person, they will lose their mind. That is the ultimate rejection. That is the ultimate betrayal. And in their mind, why wouldn't you have told me? because they believe they can take they can take that feedback they can't they're so fragile and so self-conscious that if you ever tell them hey this didn't go so well nope they'll lose their mind they will scream at you because they're like nope the new offense is that you have told them feedback the new discussion isn't what they did it's the way you brought it up how rude or inconsiderate you were that's the new argument they use that to mask and never get to whatever that feedback is uh, the example I always use, which is an idiotic one in some ways, is if you have a toxic person in your life, how they respond doesn't have anything to do with you or your behavior. It's all about their state, their emotional state in that moment. So what you were talking about before of that lack of predictability, you don't know what you're coming home to. It's because it's all about where they're at. So if you have a partner and you come home every day, you're like, I don't know. I don't know. Are they pissed? Are they not pissed? Is this going to be a good day? So you walk in and you're assessing, what are we at? And if you can tell they're pissed immediately, what you don't know is they pissed at me or are they pissed at somebody else? And if you say, how are you doing? How was your day? And they say, blah, 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 this happened at work. There's immediate relief. Oh, thank God. They're not mad at me. But now I don't want to give any feedback because I will become the lightning rod. But if they're describing something at work, and some part of you is like, oh my God, you've got to be kidding me. Like you were dead wrong. You would never say that because you would become the target of all that anger. But now you're left with this feeling of, I think I'm kind of agreeing with them. They think I agree, but in reality, I just want to get out of this scenario without getting yelled at. If so I it's give almost no like... feedback, I could get yelled at. If I give too much feedback, I could, so it's this, what do I do? So it's like an impossible game, right? It's like, I really, if you cared about me, you would give me honest feedback. You can always come to me with that. And then it's like, how dare you give me feedback? Of course I did everything right. You're just too incompetent to see that I did it correctly, right? You exactly. couldn't understand, right? And so then it's always your fault in some capacity. And it's like, I can't win. Like, I just know that feeling. It's like, it doesn't matter what I, I cannot fucking win. You, you can't, and you literally can't. And even if you debrief that argument, which a toxic individual is always going to want to debrief later. If you have an argument, work through it, it's not over. Never. It's not over until they have talked it out enough that they feel 
you sufficiently understand what you did wrong. It's never closed. It always remains open and they can revisit it at any time they want. The reverse is not true. If they do something wrong, the expectation is you give them a pass because they believe that they are constantly giving you a pass. So they think when they do an error, they have earned so much like relationship equity that you're like, okay, yep, you never really screw up. So we don't have to talk about this. So they can't kind of believe it. And the example I often use is if you have a borderline in your life uh, or a toxic person, if you had, let's say you were having a dinner party and they come over and that person puts their jacket over the back of the seat. One day you could say, hey, would you mind hanging your jacket up? If they're in a good place, not an issue. They'll hang up the jacket and they just move on. If they're not in a good place, this could become the next big argument. The jacket they could blow up at you just from that one thing and say, I just got here. I can't believe you're giving me grief about the jacket. I bought you special presents that are in the car. I was going to take the dog for a walk. I was going to a million reasons why they didn't have to hang up their jacket and why you were so rude and so insulting. And you're sitting here going, oh my God, what? And the challenge is a, a normal person is going to say, hey, this jacket topic, scale of one to 10, is barely a level one. So if somebody reacts at a seven, it creates discomfort. It's this, whoa, I don't even know how we got here. I just, wanted, I just want this to go away. So a normal person will apologize almost immediately and be like, I didn't know any of that. I'm so sorry. I shouldn't have brought it up. I didn't know that you brought things like all. And once they have apologized enough, that toxic individual is essentially going to say, okay, well, now that you know you did something wrong, I guess we can put this to rest. But if you come back to the jacket and say, okay, good, now that we resolved that, could I hang up your jacket? The whole argument will start over again. Because if you even talk about the jacket, it means that your apology was bullshit and you didn't understand. And they will start over again and be like, I can't believe it. You clearly just apologized for no and don't agree or you wouldn't have come back. They'll never talk about the jacket. It's only about how horrible you were. And that same person, you could have them over six months later and they could walk in, hang up their jacket and look at you and go, did I hang up my jacket okay? Or am I going to get screamed at again? And you're like, what? Like that was six months ago and I was right then and I apologized, but you're bringing it up again and there's no win. If you try and joke about it, they'll be like, oh, so all you can do is hope to be like, okay, and let's move on. So they'll index that. They'll have a Rolodex of things that you have done throughout your relationship with them. And when things go wrong, they reference all of them. That goes say, in the bank. It's like they have this amazing ability to remember every negative thing ever but disassociate you from any positive things that you've done or compromises or sacrifices because you tend to become almost like a prop in their movie versus like a human entity that they should have empathy and compassion and consideration for. That's perfectly said, which, which gets to the other point that you made about the why does, why do some people gravitate towards or find these types of people. And again, it's a generalization in some ways, but I think, unfortunately, there is a symbiotic kind of relationship early when you meet somebody between somebody who is more of this toxic or narcissistic person versus people who are more uh, natural empaths, caregivers, kind of people pleasers, peacekeepers, like the people who naturally just want to like make everything okay for everybody. What happens is in the very early part of a relationship, when these two people meet, they're drawn to each other because a narcissist is kind of unabashed. They know what they want. They want you. So the very first part of the relationship is really appealing because they, they, they will seek you out. They want to spend time with you. They want to be with you all the time. They dote on you. They want to bring you everywhere. They want to... There's something really appealing to that. And when you're naturally an empath or a people pleaser, and what somebody wants is to just make you happy. But that's because in that phase, they are serving their narcissistic 
need. They want you. So yeah, you this are comes the down target. To, like, um, I think this is, I don't know if this applies to every category of narcissism, but I know with the grandiose narcissist, there's a phase of like love bombing, right? It's this infatuation and obsession. And as the party on the other side, you just find it almost flattering and, and complimentary. Like, how could I be so special? They're so interested in yep. me. Like, that's exciting. Maybe you haven't received that type of attention before. And it tends to be kind of this constant communication, this constant questioning, this constant interest in you, where for them, it's like, it's a game. And I want to mm -hmm. catch this thing and catch this individual because it's the shiny object in which I do not have. So for you, it feels as though they're genuinely interested. And then for them, it's like, no, you're just a prize to be one. And that in some ways is, is where we have a slight shift between kind of a, a true narcissist and more of a borderline personality disorder. Uh, for a narcissist, or, or if you move towards, you know, sociopathy, it can just be you're a full on prize, and they know what they're doing. And they want to win the prize and then be done with it. Sometimes when you get more into a high functioning narcissist or borderline, they don't even know. They don't know that this is just the infatuation part of the like, well, I want I want this. This is my desire. This is the object of my interest. They truly believe it. They believe that that's what they want. The problem is once they get it. So in the beginning, it's, yeah, it's this love bombing of like, oh my God, they always want to know where I am. There is none of these like games. They're just, they want to be together all the time. You know, and early on feels amazing. They have such interest. But once they get you, once the relationship has been established, that moves into their expectation. They now expect that you are part of their arsenal of getting their needs met. People will find a like, hey, we started dating. It was amazing. It was great. There was all of this interest. And then there was a shift. All of a sudden, you're not necessarily their desired target. You are now part of their network of helping them get all of their other needs met. So... That's where you see, you know, a narcissist will basically say, oh, well, let's go away this particular weekend. And if you say, oh, I can't because I have this other event before it would have been a, oh, no problem. I'll come with you. Like we'll make a weekend of it. All of a sudden it turns into, no, this is a big inconvenience and they'll be mad. And you'll be like, I don't really understand why you're angry. And again, it's that same letting you know how off you are. And how, like, I can't believe you would just casually tell me you couldn't come. You just said, no, that was so hard. And you're like, what's happening? I don't, you know, there was a better way for me to say I had something that was scheduled like six months ago. And then they'll go into, well, now you're being dismissive of my feel. Like, and it's baffling. And in that initial phase, especially for people who are, like I said, more natural, like empaths or people pleasers. If there's any amount of indecisiveness, then dating somebody who is more narcissistic or borderline, they, they see the world in black and white. They think they know the right choice always. So if you are more naturally indecisive and you start dating somebody who wants to know everything about you, is constantly kind of trying to get your affection, wants you present all the time, and they love to make decisions, love it. So now all of a sudden, if you're not sure, oh, should we go out for pizza or do we want to go get burgers? And they're like pizza. For somebody who's less decisive or it, that feels great because it's like, oh my God, no discussion. You knew exactly what we wanted. And for somebody who's more in that people pleasing mode, they learn that their, their best value in a group setting is not having strong opinions that make it harder for the group to make a choice. So if you date somebody who's like, hey, I always know exactly what I want all the time, it's actually really like a nice relief. It's a, what should we do this weekend? We should go skiing. Okay, great. Should we go to this wedding? Should we go to that wedding? They're, oh, we have to go to this one. There's something actually really relieving about being with somebody who's like, oh, I know exactly what we should do. Until you get further into a relationship and you realize it's not even. You don't have a say. And if you do have a say and you've chosen wrong, you know, I, I can't put that in air quotes for people listening, but like, if you make the wrong choice, they're mad. And even as the relationship goes on, the irony is for a narcissist or a borderline, 
the they would do better with another type A person who is going to, who is going to, you know, say, no, this, we're not always doing it your way. We should, but they can't tolerate that. That relationship will never last. If they date somebody who stands up for themselves and won't just cave and do the relationship ends, even though long run, that's probably a better person for them. So if they meet somebody who's much more accommodating, that works in the beginning and then down the line, the very thing they wanted in the beginning starts to piss them off. This notion of why am I always in charge? How come I always have to make the decisions? How come I always have to do it? How come every time I ask you to do something, you don't do it right? It's because they want you to not just make the decision. You want, they want you to make the right decision. They want you to do it the way they would do it. And so that gets people into a position of, now I'm guessing. Now, if you ask me to make a reservation, I'm not just going to make a reservation. I'm thinking to myself, uh-oh, what do you want? And what would be the right place? And what would be the, and okay, I have to call and I have to recall. And you're just hoping you get it right. And again, going all the way back to what we talked about, getting it right or wrong is all dependent on their emotional state at the time. There is no get it right. Yeah, no, it's 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 really fascinating and quite complex to understand because if you're programmed a certain way, you can't ever try to wrap your mind around how someone thinks that way or operates that way because it's not inherent to you, which can be incredibly complicated when you're leaving that type of relationship or trying to get out of it, understanding that it's it's toxic, but then at what point and how do you leave? And then there's the, but what if it changes? What if he changes or her? You know, there are female narcissists, so I don't want to play to just the him, but tends to keep people in it. Like, oh, if I just wait long enough, then we'll have another good day. And uh, the way that she relates to it in the book is almost like this roller coaster, right? It's like the highs are so high and it's like, it's perfect, but the lows are like the absolute worst days of your life. Um, and it's this undulation of, well, if, if I just do this right, or say this right, or arrange this thing, um, that hopefully we'll get back to this kind of, uh, fantasy stage in the beginning where everything was perfect and grandiose. And I was awesome and perfect for him. And it's almost like they seem to put this unrealistic expectation on a relationship in general. And it's this kind of fantasy of you're on a pedestal, you're this perfect imagination of a person, and mm -hmm. then you have to fit into this box that they've placed on this pedestal. And the moment that you have an ounce of normalcy where you do have your own flaws and you do make mistakes or you do get stressed or you don't follow through perfectly or maybe say it the right way. Um, mm -hmm. That's when everything kind of hits the fan. And then they're like, oh, you're not whatever it is that I thought you were be, or you just this incompetent person. And then you can see phases of gaslighting and kind of warping reality, which can make things significantly more confusing. Oh, it, it, it it's baffling because if you don't, if you don't have a window into, into this kind of very different way of processing, none of it makes sense. And very often I will say to people, you know, if you have a personality disordered individual in your life, if one, often they can be somebody you can have more fun with than anybody else. And also they can hurt you more deeply and more intensely in a second. And it's this really harsh reality of what happens is, well, but but I, I, I want the good part all the time. And maybe if I just figure this out, or if I can just change that, or I can, I can get more of the good all the time. And it's also inconsistent. And, you know, very high functioning borderlines and narcissists, they can also feel when they're approaching that point of, okay, I've done too much or too. And they will very intentionally be like, you know what? This Friday, I'm going to make sure it's an amazing night. And then all of a sudden, you, when you were starting to think, do I need to get out of this? Do I need to end? All of a sudden, there's the good again. And I know it's a funny comparison, but I sometimes think about it like trying to quit a TV show you've been watching for a long time. You're invested in the characters. In the very beginning, it was an unbelievable show, but it starts to go off the rails a little bit. And what happens is people will say, nah, not quite this intentionally, people will say, okay, if there is five bad episodes in a row, I'm quitting the show. I'm done. I'm not going to watch it anymore. And four bad episodes in a row, but then the fifth episode is great. And they're like, huh, 
okay, well, maybe this is the start of it getting better. And then that, that sixth episode goes right back to being bad again. And you're like, huh, well, but I said it had to be five in a row. And you start over again. And then a few episodes in, half the episode's great, half the episode's terrible. And it just keeps resetting it because it's hard to cancel a show or to stop watching a show when it still has some really good aspects. And the more you've invested in it, the longer you've been watching it, the harder it is to say, am I just going to stop watching? And if you do, if you get to the place where you can say, you know what? No, I have to be done with this. They always stay in view. So it's, it's almost as if you can't get away from it. You could be trying to watch a different show and you'll see a trailer or a teaser for like the next episode. And you're like, crap, that actually looks really good. You know, and then you start questioning, did I stop watching? And that was really my bad. Or, and that's the equivalent of them reaching out and saying, hey, hope you're doing well. You know, hey, sorry how things ended. Like, really miss you, but like, I get it. And you're like, huh, okay, I don't know what to do with that. Because when I started to tell you I needed some distance, you lost your mind and you were horrible to me. But now you're getting the nice part. Now you're getting the, you know, oh, you reach out late or they reach out at just the right time when you're having trouble with another friend. And they're like, hey, I know, I know. And they... And you get this wonderful, warm, because some part of them is like, well, I'll get you back and then I'll decide whether or not I still watch it. Yeah. And that's, I think that's a concept called hoovering. Correct me if I'm wrong, where they kind of come back in and leverage you on some side to like pull you back in. But the way that she breaks it down is, is it's more like your fuel for their narcissistic supply. So they tend to be um, people that have multiple relationships to fill different voids within their ego that one person could not possibly fuel right mm -hmm. so then it's this um they somebody else might have fallen off i'll just go back to this person who was really good for this period of time and kind of reel them back in until i get bored and then i'll go back over here um and one thing that she pointed out which i thought was fascinating is that a lot of people struggle to exit that relationship even if they know that it's toxic because they tend to grasp the hope that they had for the future. And one thing that those personalities tend to do is future pace. So they, in the beginning, when they're super curious about you, it tends to be about like what your desires are, what your wants are, what your aspirations are, kind of what you're looking for. And they can paint this picture of a future potential with them but it tends to be filled with broken promises and unfulfilled uh, words or ideas that you hold out hope for because when they can leverage your emotions by saying, well, if you were going to do this, I was going to propose, but because you've been such a blah, 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 I don't think I'm ready to do that with you. When you get your act right and you can understand me, then maybe we'll move forward, right? And they can kind of manipulate and twist your emotions and desires against you to get you to almost operate as their, their prop, like I said, kind of in their movie and play the role correctly. Yeah. And it's, it's a really, it's a really tough thing to become a part of because one, if you've invested time and energy and effort, it benefits you in some ways, if it comes out nicely and a narcissist they also really train people to say, hey, talking about us to other people is a violation of our trust. It's a violation of our relationship. So what they really want people to do is, hey, when I'm awful at home, don't tell anyone else. So they want to keep that behavior hidden. So now a more kind of normal person is trying to cover for them is trying to make them look good, wants other people to see the positive sides of them. So you put in all of this energy and effort and time, and so much of it is just because they are so convincing in, in what they believe is right and wrong, and they can make you wonder, and they can make you question it. And it's all hidden. It's all behind the scenes. It's not until you start breaking out of that and telling people, what's going on and you see their reaction. And one problem is if you tell people who know that in individual, they know that, that toxic person, but they've never seen that side of it. They can't believe it. 
Yeah. If you got, if you've been out with a group and everything looked fine and they were making everybody laugh and it was the life of the party and you might not even know that you did something that pissed them off until you get in the car at the end of it. And all of a sudden their whole demeanor changes. And they're like, I can't believe you said that. And you're like, what? I literally did not know that I had done anything. I would have thought that was the best night ever. And then we get in the car and I get a lecture. I get a lecture about what I did wrong, how I approached it wrong, how insulting that was. How... And if you call somebody to say, either to check in and say, hey, did this come off really badly? They're going to be like, no, not at all. And if you tell them, they're going to be like, yeah, I think you're missing it. They accidentally will perpetuate this because if they've been with you all night and everything seemed great, and then you tell them what happened when you left, they can't believe it because it doesn't make sense. Yeah. Because most people, if they were really angry, you would see it. You would see them get quiet. You would see them have a scowl. Most people are not as good at hiding it as they think they are. And so if you call somebody and the response they give is, uh, something else must have happened, or maybe you took this out of context, or maybe maybe they were just upset. Maybe they were... It feeds into this feeling of, okay, maybe maybe I am crazy. Maybe this was my fault. Maybe... But they haven't seen any of that behavior. So it isn't until you stop hiding it and you stop trying to help them have the outward appearance that they want and that you wish they had. And you tell people the truth and they say, holy crap, if that's going on, like that's awful. And you say, oh my God, thank God somebody has validated that this is completely unfair, that this is completely unfathomable. That is when you start to have that confidence to say, I think I need to step away from this. But it's hard to get if you've been told, hey, talking to anybody about it is a huge problem. And you're still not sure if, if you're like, well, now if I talk to somebody about it and I was wrong, that could end the relationship. You know, so it takes a long time to get out of it because the whole time it's this roller coaster. Yeah. And it, it seems like um, there's this... Uh... First, they try to get you away from your support system, right? I think that isolation is one of the things that happens in that relationship. It's like, I want you to be here with me. And then you start to pull away from your friends and family because it's like, oh, I wanted to spend time with you this weekend. You don't need to hang out with her, do you? I had something really special planned, right? And it starts to get you pulled away in ways that you aren't necessarily aware because they're not saying, oh, you can't hang out with them. It's like, but I really had something actually really special planned. So is it okay if we don't do that this weekend? And then the way that they can present themselves in public, kind of playing that poker face of everything's fantastic, they're the life of the party, they're so charismatic, they're fun to be around, right? And then you, I think a part of it too is if you're the person that's receiving that kind of the car door closes and you're getting your ass reamed out, it's like, well, how do I even justify this happening when it's so polar opposite of what they see? So then you have this like, almost shame associated with the fact that one, you're tolerating this because at some point in your life, most of us have learned self-respect and people will be like, oh, I'd never date somebody that would treat me like that. It's easy to say until you're in that situation, especially if it's kind of saturated itself and slowly you've retracted from the social life and gatherings that you've had to then come out to an old friend and be like, well, actually the guy that you think is super fucking phenomenal, like you know, broke my cell phone seven times because he wanted to go through it and saw, thought that me texting my guy friend, Sean was, you know, whatever. And you don't realize how light and dark, right? What a, what a drastic shift it could be at the drop of a dime. Mm -hmm. And it's so hard to share it with people because often some of it is either, is either not visible, or even if you showed people, there's nothing to show them. So when you have a toxic person in your life, like there are a few things that I always default to. One is there's intense hypocrisy. The rules for how you treat them and how they treat you are not even remotely close. And if you ever try and call them out on 
wait, I don't get it. How is this any different than what happened? That will set them off in a whole other level because they are so positive that they are right and that they do life right and you don't. So telltale signs of this are one, if you have, if you have a toxic person in your life, if you text them and they don't get back to you for two, three, four days, no problem. That's fine. If they text you and you don't get back to them within five minutes, you'll get a follow-up text message with all question marks. Kind of like, almost like the, where are you? Like, how, you must be seeing this. I've summoned you. How could you, you? not respond? Where right. are you? Exactly. I've summoned you. Um, and, you know, or they'll send another message that says like, hey, it's been really tough to get a hold of you this week. You must be really busy. I hope you're not working too hard. And the problem is, if you showed that to 10 people, they'd be like, oh, what a kind message. No, it isn't. That is a silent F you. Mm -hmm. That is their way of saying, I have called, I've texted, you haven't responded. Unacceptable. But they haven't said that. They said, you must be really busy. I hope you're really taking time for yourself. What they mean is, mm, I don't like when anybody or anything is prioritized over me. They believe they should always win. They should always be your top priority, no matter what. Doesn't matter if you're in work. Well, you shouldn't answer the phone for other people. You should answer the phone for them. But if you call them and they're at work, they, they would never answer the phone. N not, if they, not if they don't think that's warranted at that moment. You know you have this kind of toxic person in your life. If you can tell when they are mad at you and you haven't spoken to them, no communication, and you just know. You know, uh, there was a group thread, you know, and something about it, like, you know. You're just, yep, I know. I Or it's been too many days since I reached out. You can tell when they're mad. And if you don't respond and then you reach out to them, they will very often just not take your calls for two, three days at a time because they think you're, they're punishing you. Mm -hmm. They believe, well, you missed my phone call. You know, you missed my text. You know, that's on you. And now you don't get access to me. And very often they don't realize for a lot of people, that's actually quite a relief to be like, all right, well, you're, you're mad at me and you don't want to talk to me. Or you said, you don't want to see me this weekend. Okay. But then they'll keep checking in. I know we decided not to talk this weekend, but I thought you would want to know that like, you know, such and such is on TV this weekend. And you're like, what? You know, or they'll reach out and be like, you know, honestly, I'm not ready to talk yet, but we need to discuss our plans for 4th of July this summer. And you're like, what? Like, but that's their way of saying, I can't believe you haven't tried to reach out. But if you did, when they told you not to, that's also going to piss them off. Yeah. And then it's, oh. you've lost your privileges to me. I've right. made that abundantly clear. Yep. Right. And, like and when we trouble. hang out, I'm going to be cold or harsh. And it's Oh, Go sorry. Ahead. Yeah. Okay. No, no, no. I was just going to say, so when it comes to, I think that there's a couple things that I want to get very clear for people, because I don't want them to think that because you have narcissistic traits, that means you are a narcissistic personality, right? Because many people should have confidence. They should be charismatic. They're outgoing people, right? That doesn't mean that they're narcissists. So how do we delineate between someone who's just kind of that way, but still is kind of normal, but not normal? And then someone who's truly a narcissistic personality disorder. Uh, it, I, I mean, I think that kind of comes back to the toxicity piece because uh, personality disorders are essentially a description of a whole group of personality traits. So that's why the number of people who will go online and, and take a, a personality test, uh, you know, just one of these like, yep, I click buttons and it tells me whether or not I have narcissistic tendencies that can come out and, and say, okay, yeah, you have some of the traits, but from a diagnostic standpoint, it's literally listed as like, you need at least three from column A and four from column B or five from column B and one from col a narcissist or borderline can actually present very differently. In the movies, people love to present uh, a, a borderline as this totally volatile, self-injurious, like you need to leave this house immediately. And then they say, well, but if you leave, I'm going to hurt myself. That's one presentation, a high functioning borderline. Uh, there's a book that I love called Stop Walking on Eggshells. 
And there's, it's like a one page part of it where they describe a high functioning borderline. And the first paragraph describes it as a Jekyll and Hyde, mm. where how they present to one group of people can be totally different. And they reserve that other part of them just for their tight knit or close inner circle. And so some of it in terms of the diagnostic criteria, yeah, we all have some of those traits. If you just looked at the list, you'd be like, yeah, I have these three. But that doesn't necessarily meet, mean you meet criteria for a diagnosis. And as you said, narcissism in and of itself doesn't mean that it's toxic. You know, so people will very often talk about you know, a, a toxic or malignant borderline or narcissist. Uh, there, are some, there are some narcissists who can be the most generous people you'll ever meet. You know, uh, giving of their time, of, of money, of all. The difference is like they give to things that they believe are the right thing to give to, but that's okay. A lot of people in business settings do really well when they have some of that, some of those narcissistic traits without the more malignant or the using people or having kind of two different presentations. In some ways, if you want to be the head of a small business or a large business, you have to have some of those traits mm -hmm. because you can't make everybody happy all the time. And if you take a true empath and put them in charge of something where they have to make multiple decisions a day that impact people's lives, they're going to be torn up inside. Uh, but it's a hard thing to do. Whereas a, a functional narcissist might say, yep, I understand that it hurts people, but I have to make a choice. So it can have really wonderful sides to it, like any personality trait or disorder, uh, not disorder, but any personality traits, even empathy and people who are very caring, it can be great. And it can also go to a level where it can be very self-destructive. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's really more in the category of if you find that there is this hidden component, these things that other people don't see, these attempts to, uh, to abuse or take advantage of or make people feel small or belittled, that's what I think of as when it gets more towards the toxic side. Um, uh, I very often will talk about this kind of personality style as what I describe as a taser person. Imagine if you have somebody in your life who anytime you hang out with them, they have a taser in their hand. They tell you like, oh, I, we, we might have a great dinner tonight, or I might tase you. I don't know. You don't know. And I can change the, uh, how, how strong, anywhere from a one all the way to a 10. Well, if you hang out with that person the whole time, you know, there's a taser. You know, there's a possibility that you are going to get yelled at. You don't know, which means you also don't know if it was fun until it's over. So you'll go out to dinner with that person. You'll go out with a group and the whole time you're not sure. Somebody else might say something. And if you're close with that toxic person, you're going to be like, uh oh, they went in a direction that I know is going to piss this person off. Are they going to tase that person? Are they going to tase me? Am I going to get tased in the car? So you're almost trying to head it off to make sure nobody upsets that person because they have a taser on them. The problem is a really functional taser person doesn't show everybody the taser. So if you're sitting around a dinner table and you're waiting for a group of friends to show up, they might have the taser out. But as soon as everybody shows up, the taser gets put away. So you know it's there, but nobody else does. A toxic individual has a small taser that they always keep out, almost looks like chapstick, but it can only tase you at like a 0.5. And other people don't know it's a taser. They think it's them being kind of sassy or like a little bit like playful. They might make jokes about somebody and you know it's a taser and they don't. They're just like, ha ha, this person loves to kind of give people grief. But you know, if they, if they really want to bring out the big taser and tase you. But that's the little thing of they could be in the middle of telling a story that you've heard a thousand times. And if you get up to go to the bathroom, that's a narcissistic injury. You haven't, that you weren't so enraptured by them, which means when you come back, they might be like, oh, had to go so bad. You couldn't be here for the punchline. And everybody else will just hear that as kind of a little like, you know, oh, they have like a little bit of bite to them because they can only use that small taser in that moment. And now you're like, uh-oh, when we get in the car, the big taser is coming out. I now know there's trouble. And it's exhausting. It's exhausting because you just don't know. You don't know what's, <laughs> whether or not something was enjoyable until it's over and you didn't get tased. 
But imagine that. Imagine if every time you get together with that one person, the whole time you're kind of like, I hope this goes well. And I'm on edge the whole time, making sure nothing happens that brings the taser out. And at the end of the night, you go your separate ways and you're like, okay, now that it's over, concluded, we have retired to our separate you know, area and I didn't get tased. That was really fun. But the whole time I had no clue, no clue whether or not like I may or may not get tased. That is the best analogy I think I've ever heard to describe it because it's spot on. And I think the sad part about it too is that when you're going into an event, you have no idea if you're going to get tased. You are trying so hard to conform yourself to the role in which they want you to play that you can't even be present. If it is good in hindsight, Mm -hmm. you couldn't have even enjoyed that experience as yourself. Right. Because the whole time you were holding back a little bit, the whole time you were performing a little bit. And if you have a taser person in your life, it's also being around the more people you're around, the more stressful it is. Because the more people who could potentially upset that person, and then you don't know who's getting tased. And if it's the person that you're dating and they tase a friend, it's really embarrassing right? An empath will he- will feel that as like, almost like it was my responsibility to see that coming and prevent it. So other people didn't have to experience this. And if people are like, wow, he was kind of a jackass. Like it's almost this, oh no, it just, there's this almost immediate instinct to be like, oh, they saw kind of a glimpse into the bad side of them. And what if we do stay together? What if it does get better? I almost don't want people to see that because then what does it mean if this does work out? Or you might hear from across the room, somebody say something and you're like, "Uh oh, that is a, and you may be the one that they may still have a great conversation and be laughing. And you're like, I know they're pissed. And I know there's now going to be a conversation of why do you like that person? Why do you hang out with them? I don't want to hang out with them anymore. Like you're going to get the taste. You become essentially a lightning rod for all of that built up charge. So if at the end of a party, there have been seven or eight things that frustrated that toxic individual to the point where they wanted to give out like seven or eight different like tases anywhere from like a one all the way to a nine, it's all built up. Which means now you're in the car going, be really careful. Like, because if you move the wrong way, if you do the wrong thing, all that pent up electricity is coming right at you. And so, there's no way to say, wait, I didn't do it. And if they say your friend was really a, well, now what you're left with is, okay, my options are agree and avoid being tased, but then I've agreed. Or say, honestly, I don't think so. And now I'm going to get tased. So what's my option? Well, that's what I meant earlier when I was like, it's it's literally like an impossible situation for you to win because you have to agree. And like even the point about the friend, because let's say the friend says something that upsets your partner, even though you didn't say it in the end, it will be your fault because it was your friend and you invited them to the party and they wanted to have a good time at the party and they couldn't because of your friend that you brought. And it was unacceptable. Even if you weren't the direct person that shot that thing that upset them, you're associated with the entity that did and therefore you are guilty. And then if you don't agree with them being upset over something, then you are the person that they're battling against, you are now the the target until you conform to agreeing with what they believed in the first place, even if you don't agree with it at all. Yep. And that's where it starts to make people act and comport themselves outside of their norm Mm -hmm. because you're avoiding other people getting tased and yourself getting tased. So if you are in a relationship and you bring that person to be with your family, Well, a bunch of things can happen. One is if they win over or like a family member, that becomes their like ride or die. You go to Thanksgiving and they're, and you're like, okay, I know they're going to be off with my brother or off with my, like, and that is the only person they're going to want to hang out with. And some part of you is like, it's weird because they bring out this weird part of, and I don't love it, but I don't want to say anything because somehow that person in my family is like the anti-taser. You know, so I guess I'm going to tolerate this weird behavior 
because there's no taser involved. And I can't say to them, hey, when we're with my family, I don't love when you do that because it's okay, well, either you let me do that or the taser's coming out. <laughs> Your call. And you're like, I guess I'm going to tolerate that behavior. Or you bring them into your family and the whole time you're like, uh-oh, what's going to happen? And if your family puts up some boundaries, puts up some limits, if there's somebody who says like, okay, like, no. Well, all of a sudden, they're more likely to be like, I don't want to hang out with your family. They're rude. They're awful. They're mean. And the funny thing is now what you end up with is, well, what do I do here? Because I would rather hang out with my family without them. I can relax or if you can't relax with your family, you're at least saying like, now I only have to deal with my family. I don't have to try and figure out how to handle my family the way I handle my family, but then also figure out how to, but if they don't want to be with your family, it's also going to be a narcissistic injury or a rejection for them. If you, if they say, well, I don't want to go. And you say, I totally, totally understand that I'm going to go. Well, then you've now chosen them over that person and they're going to be mad. Because what they really want is for you to say, you're right. They're awful and I don't want to be with them either. And they're like, okay, that's the right decision. And they also, some part of them wants you to be like, well, I couldn't possibly go without you. Like yeah. you're what makes it tolerable. You're what makes it fun. They're horrible. You're amazing. You have to come. That doesn't work for them either because they want to be wanted, but they also don't want to be made to go and do anything they don't want to do. So at best, you will get them to say, you know what, fine, you can go and like see your family once a year, but then they will just criticize it. It'll be, oh, you can go and see your stupid family. Oh, you can go and like, oh, don't, like the whole time they'll belittle it. I can't believe you feel the need to do this. Like, I can't believe you haven't gotten to a point where you can just say no to your family. I can't. It'll be like nonstop berating because it's a rejection if you go. So if someone is either in a new relationship and they're not sure, like, I don't know if this is me just being nervous about previous relationships, maybe, and kind of projecting onto them that they're this type of personality, or maybe they're lost in it and they don't know how to exit. What would mm -hmm. your opinion be on someone who wants to feel out the red flags, right? Who might just be projecting, or maybe it is, and they just want clarity, and then on the other side of the spectrum, let's say someone's been in it for a while and they know they need to leave, but they are terrified of doing so. How would you approach each of those? Ooh, how long do we have? Um, as long as we need. <laughs> uh, I think, let me start off by saying, if anybody is in a scenario where they feel afraid, like not just afraid of, uh, of kind of a negative outcome or being yelled at or being if there's actual fear of how they could be treated or how they could, you know, be either verbally abused, physically abused, if there's like straight up legit danger, then you exit by not actually having any confrontation. You do what you need to do to be as safe as possible. And you take your stuff and you go, you know, you make sure you are not face to face when that explosion happens, you know, baseline always, if you have any concern about your own safety or well-being you put that at paramount don't ever no, don't ever i i try to avoid ever saying things that like in this definitive you know but if you are afraid or worried sometimes there is a desire to override that and say okay maybe that's a little bit dramatic that's when people very often will push themselves way outside of their comfort zone because they don't want to believe it's that bad i would always rather somebody err on the side of caution and be like, okay, maybe that was overly, you know, protective or may don't care. I would always rather somebody err on the side of like, this is what made me feel the safest. Because if you call somebody or you text them and let them know, and, and they have the explosion you are afraid of, you are going to be so thankful. You are not sitting there yeah, and that you are not in a scenario where you're like, okay, this breakup is going to be three hours of me getting screamed at. And then I, and then I'll finally leave. When you have somebody really toxic like this that you're trying to extricate yourself from, uh, it, it's equivalent to having somebody who's an emotional terrorist. They can hold you hostage. 
the challenge is if you've had a long history with somebody, you want there to be a way to work through it where there, there's some understanding. If you are deep into a relationship and you realize, hey, this is not good for me, it's getting really comfortable with the fact that that relationship might end and that person will believe with every fiber of their being that this was your fault, that they did nothing wrong and that this was all your nonsense. And that is what they will tell people. And that, that can be really hard for people to be like, I can't believe this is going to end with that person believing this was me. Sometimes I think it is getting really comfortable with the notion that one, anybody that they tell all of that to, if they know that person, even a little, won't say anything because they don't want to get tased, but they also likely have seen the taser and they know that some part of it is bull. And, you know, it's trying to say like, however this person chooses to spin this story, whatever they want to do. And by the way, if you end a relationship with somebody like this, they will do their very best to have a Facebook perfect moment as soon as humanly possible with another person. Yeah. Uh, whether yeah. it's a, whether it's a best friend, whether it's another relationship, if you reject them, they will want to make sure that next weekend they went away with a group of friends and they will put up more pictures on Facebook and Instagram than you've ever seen. You know, they will date somebody and like all of a sudden, like, announce publicly that they're in a relationship and there will be a pit and they'll make it out to be unbelievable because they need the public facing that comes back around to the importance of the audience. They want the audience to be like, Whoa, look at this person. Could they really be that bad if they ended up with the like best relationship they've ever had with? And again, it could be a horrible relationship. It's all about how it appears. So whatever they think is going to be the most jealousy inducing forward facing they might date somebody horrible if all they care about is the physical appearance or they might go the other direction and say like well i'm going to date somebody who has like an unbelievable resume because that's they're going for whatever more people are going to appear jealous of um so if you walk away you are the villain and just to remind you that they're doing fantastic without you they will mm -hmm. replace you and make it known. Yep. They want you to know and they want everybody else to know because you rejecting them threatens their ability to hold up this facade. You know, and they are going to want to make sure that's corrected as soon as possible. And so one, they will make sure to let other people know that they were not rejected, which means they either have to badmouth you or they have to basically make it out to be like it was their choice. So their story does not have to be anywhere near reality. And with a toxic individual or somebody who has these personality disorder traits, they believe it. Yeah. They don't even know that they are spinning a story. They believe it. So on the one side, it's just knowing there are times you cannot control the narrative. You can't control the story. And you have to trust that who you are and the people that know you will will not all of a sudden question your character. They're not all of a sudden going to be like, oh, wow, maybe you're not who I... No, the people who know you might never really know what happened, but sometimes that fear of what will people think of me keeps people in this like, okay, maybe I should keep working through to at least a place where we can arrive at a, like, we're going to end this amicably and we're both going to agree. It's not going to happen. It is either going to appear to be their choice 100%, which means it has to be about something horrible you did. Yep. Or, you know, it has to be that they were just like, eh, like I decided this was no good for me. And they will just say things that just are blatantly untrue. If you're in a new relationship, a lot of people struggle with the like, am I identifying red flags out of self-protection and I'm cutting everybody out before I even give them a chance. There's some of that, especially if you've had a, a tough relationship or anything like this, you're going to be looking out for anybody who has a taser. If you date somebody who's sarcastic, but they, they are not a taser person, you might be like, taser, I'm out. And then later you're like, was it a taser? I don't really know. If you're questioning it, I think ask yourself some of those basic things. If you were to grade the relationship, what's the range? And if you are dating somebody where it can go anywhere from an A plus to a full F, that is not great. You know, and 
every relationship has has good and bad. You know, there is no such thing as a relationship that is all good and no bad. Yeah. But it should average out to more good than bad. And not in any in one day, not in one moment. When you're starting to date, people will take snapshots. Okay, well, last night it was more bad than good. This morning was more good than bad. This afternoon was neutral. You'll exhaust yourself if you try and assess it from any one interaction. You want to be looking at it a little bit more, almost like quarterly. How did this month's numbers come out? Okay, and that doesn't mean you can't have a bad quarter where it was more bad than good. But you want to look at, then you want to look at half a year. You want to look at a year. And a lot of relationships start out more good than bad and slowly shift to be more bad than good. That's when people will stay in a relationship way longer than they should because they're like, well, we had six months where it was really good. And sure, now it's not good. But am I going to throw away those six months? No, who's throwing away the six months? You know, if you had six good months, great, enjoy that. That was awesome. That also doesn't mean that you owe somebody another year and a half of like trying to get back to that six months. So I think it's trusting your own gut. It's making sure that you look for some of those telltale signs of, is there behavior I feel uncomfortable telling some of my close friends or family? Are there things I feel like I'm not sure about, but I'm questioning? If the range goes anywhere from an A plus to an F, you know, often that means in some ways, yep, maybe you can have more fun with them than anybody else, but it shouldn't be an F. There shouldn't be days or times in a new relationship where you feel awful about yourself. Or fearful to advocate for yourself or set a boundary or spend time with other people, right? So I think yep. um, always assessing the response to a boundary for me is insightful because if I can set a boundary and you're like, oh yeah, I totally understand. I get that. Um, that's better than what are you talking about? How could you be like that? I'm trying to do X, Y, and Z. Like you're so mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. Um, I find that to be very interesting. I forgot there was something that you had, you had said uh, that I wanted to expand on and I can't remember what it was. <laughs> I always do this. It, well, it'll it'll come worry. back. <laughs> no, I, I, but I think you're right on. And I also think keep an eye out for when people say the right thing and then the follow-up doesn't match. So that's if huge. You, and I yeah, think so that this is totally a side tangent, but I think that with the nature of social media being such a platform for opinion that it eliminates the integration of action and opinion or words. We can tend to really support ideas by people who say the right thing, but, but behind closed doors don't actually do the right thing. It's not just about like setting this boundary. Okay, follow through with setting the boundary. And how do they actually respond once it's in place? That's going to be more of the eye-opening. This is their personality. This is how their ego responds to this, right? Versus, oh, they were nice, but I'm still going to go hang out with them anyway, even though I said I wasn't going to, right? Because yep. then you don't ever actually challenge that. And it might even enhance their ego and their desire for that to be filled. Because even though you said you weren't going to, you actually did to kind of stroke that ego or compensate their needs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's keeping an eye on some of those patterns, right? Also keeping an eye, an eye on whether or not you find yourself changing your mind or your opinion because you feel tense. Mm -hmm. So if, if you're dating somebody and you had plans to go away for the weekend and you say, hey, I wanted to let you know I'm going away. And they say, awesome, that's amazing. I'm so excited for that. I mean, I was hoping we could do this. Or I would, like, if they're using guilt to say like, I hope you have a great time. I just all right. And if all of a sudden you find yourself questioning, like, maybe I shouldn't go, or maybe I should go a day late, or maybe I should come back early, or, well, th there's a possibility that that is a manipulative strategy. And so I think the ability to be honest and communicate about it is going to be the difference. Because if you say to that person, hey, I feel really badly, you know, and I'm actually been thinking about it. And like, if they say, oh, God, no, like, I didn't tell you that to make you feel badly. I just wanted to let you know I was going to miss you. Like, okay. And if they say, no, I, I mean, I want you to go. And, you know, I, I mean, I get it. Like, if I was in the same scenario, I'm not sure I'd go. But well, all of a sudden, you know, when you're being honest, the response you're getting is like, yeah, I'm kind of trying to tell you the right thing to do is override. And if you then can't enjoy, if they can plant a seed enough that it can ruin something they're not even at, 
that that's an indicator that something's not going quite right. You know, if the whole time you're there, that's what you're thinking about. If they text you, you know, to say like, hey, you know, I'm headed to bed pretty soon. I was hoping that we could touch base, you know, but like, you know, I, I guess you're still out. And if you're out with that group, that is a long distance taser. That is a like, if you find you can't not respond, you know, or you worry. Well, or they're blowing is, you up like every five minutes. Non they call you every 10 minutes. And if you don't answer, then it's 50 text messages. Like I've, that is nutty. That'll drive you nuts. Yep. And it's the challenge is when you are a naturally caring or thoughtful person, the instinct is I, my behavior is making somebody feel bad. Even if it's not warranted, even if they shouldn't feel that way. Like if somebody texts and says, I've texted you six times, I'm starting to feel nervous and I'm starting to feel worried and just need to know where you are. And you have to, you know, just step out and call me back. And like, right. It's this kind of like, well, if my feeling is I, I have to respond or it's going to keep escalating. But if you text that same person, say, sorry, I have crappy service or my phone is in my pocket and they say, oh, okay, cool. Thank you. I just, I don't know why I got in my own head about it. Like have an awesome night. Okay. You might have somebody who's genuinely concerned or worried or a little overprotective or like it's gauging the response. So if they are blowing you up and calling and texting, and then finally you see your phone and you text and they don't write back. And you're like, well, what? You've texted me 15 times and you've called six times, but now all of a sudden you don't have your phone, you know, or, you know, you call them and, and they're like, sorry, I can't answer right now. I'm going to bed. Like, glad you're okay. And you're like, what? Like you've called me nonstop. And then when I reached out, you rejected. Yeah, that was those are the kind of things I would say that if in an early phase or even not early, early, because that's when you're not going to see this. It's really that mid phase where you're already getting into like a couple months in and you feel like you should be past that. But the second you are out of reach of them, you're getting a lot of that that behavior where you're like, I can't stop thinking about it. It's occupying my mental energy of how they're going to respond, you know. If you're worried about like, oh, well, I'm not going to put up any pictures because like that might make this person mad. That might upset this person. Like, so where you're asking other people, hey, like, can we just not put any of these up until like we get home? It's because like, there's some sort of, of concern there of how that person is going to respond and it's impacting your ability to be present. That's the kind of stuff I would say to look out for is and trust that instinct. Trust that instinct to, and then talk to them about it. Just like you said, can I set the boundary and how do people respond? If somebody says, ah, I know, I know I can be way over possessive. I just, here's why and here's what happened and like crap. Okay. But if they say that and then it's a like, so there is no working on this together to figure out a way. You will now do this my way moving forward. No, that doesn't work. That's not, that's not an equal relationship. I feel like we could talk about this all day and I have a list of other questions that I want to talk to you about, such as the dark triad and getting into psychopathy. So we're going to have to have you back. Uh, oh my, I will a, come back anytime. <laughs> this was a phenomenal podcast. I will plug all of your contact stuff below. Uh, Josh, thank you so much for your time today and navigating narcissistic relationships. And even we didn't even get into like how it presents in the workplace and all those things. So uh, we will definitely have to do a part two to this. Oh, amazing. All right, Josh, well, thank you thank so much. Thank you so much for having me on. This was awesome. It's, uh, it's really as a nice conversation. And I hope it's helpful for some people. And oh, you know. obviously I read this whole book in like three days. I want to read this. So it'll be, it'll be great. Um, and I'm sure we'll have a lot of questions that we can dive into. Maybe I'll post a Q and A and we can, oh, awesome. we can go from there. Oh, that'd be great. All right, Josh, I'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.